I have a mug for every video. Hi besties, welcome. Today I hope your day does not feel like finding out that your uncle married your mother only two short months after your father has died. That would be a bummer. Today we're talking about Willie Shakes. The Bard himself, perhaps the greatest playwright of all time. I talk about William Shakespeare a lot on my channel and a lot of times when I do I get comments asking for like a beginner's guide video. Today I'm delivering. Briefly before I jump in, I have learned to approach Shakespeare from an actor's point of view because I performed a lot of Shakespeare. I have incorporated that into how I read the plays. First and foremost, I want you to know that you already know Shakespeare. Come What May, that's from Macbeth. Break the Ice, that's Taming of the Shrew. Laughing Stock, that's from Merry Wives of Windsor. A Wild Goose Chase, that comes from Romeo and Juliet. And not only were so many common phrases in the English language originated by William Shakespeare, but so were so many words that we use on a daily basis. Words like admirable, baseless, hostile, long-legged, even watchdog. All of these words and phrases are straight out of Shakespeare's catalog of work. We have him to thank for so many of the idioms and cliches and phrases that we use on a daily basis without even knowing where they come from. And all that is to say, Shakespeare doesn't have to be overwhelming. But I understand. Approaching a 500 year old text can be a little bit intimidating. The language doesn't seem like something we're familiar with. But I'm gonna help you out. First, the basics. Who the hell was this William Shakespeare guy that every English teacher in high school creams their jeans over? William Shakespeare was an Englishman who was born in 1556, lived to be 52, and died in 1616. But he made good use of his time here on earth because in his 52 short years, he wrote 38 plays and around 155 sonnets. He wrote tragedies. He wrote comedies. He wrote histories. We'll get to what all those are later. But he wrote plays of all different kinds of genres and completely shaped the way drama has persisted in our culture today. He's the most referenced, most adapted, and most frequently performed playwright of all time. But he's not as intimidating as he sometimes seems. Shakespeare wrote for the masses. Shakespeare didn't write because he wanted to make you feel stupid. Shakespeare wrote so that people would feel the full weight of young love and the full weight of vengeance. He wrote plays that are so brilliant that we keep putting the same plays on stage and we keep going to see the same plays over and over and over. I don't know how many times I've seen Hamlet or Midsummer on stage and every single time it's different and every time I hear something new. His language seems a little bit flowery and pretentious to those of us reading it today. But he wasn't writing for some elite upper class. He was writing plays for everyone. His plays have more sex jokes than any other author I've ever read. A Shakespeare teacher of mine once told me that Shakespeare is about three things, food, sex, and murder. And most of the time, the murder has something to do with the sex. So we don't have to take him too seriously. Honestly, I don't think he would have wanted us to. As often as he's writing soliloquies in his histories that honor and flatter the members of the monarchy that commissioned him to write the plays, he's writing dick jokes in Much Ado About Nothing. When Lady Macbeth says, I have given suck and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me, she means a couple of different things. In the Globe Theater where Shakespeare's plays were first performed, his plays were seen by everyone from the monarchy all the way to the peasants. There was an entire section of standing room for the poor people and they weren't afraid to heckle. But that brings us to another point. His plays were meant to be performed. They were meant to be seen and experienced in a theater, not to be popcorn read in a high school English class. And while I totally understand why his plays are read, we use them all the time and they're super important in the canon of English literature, it's important to approach Shakespeare the way it was meant to be consumed. Even if you are reading it, there are ways to incorporate theater elements that can drastically improve your experience. Plus, these are some of the most adapted and retold stories of all time. You already know what's going on. You just know Romeo and Juliet as Danny Zuko and Sandra D. But one of the most helpful things in understanding what the heck is going on in a five act Shakespeare play is getting familiar with the structure. Let's talk about the genres. Scholars debate about how many genres of Shakespeare plays there are, but there's three main ones. First, you have your comedies, which are hilarious, lots of witty comebacks and usually end with a wedding, like A Midsummer Night's Dream or Twelfth Night. Then you have your tragedies. These are plays about murder, betrayal, 
and revenge and usually end in a lot of death, like Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, or Othello. And finally, of the big three, we have our histories. These are fictionalized accounts of true events or people, sometimes plays that Shakespeare was commissioned to write for the monarchy, the Richards, the Henrys, and King John. Now, some people also include a fourth genre of the obscure plays, also called the romance plays or the problem plays. And these include plays that don't fit as perfectly into one of these other categories, The Winter's Tale or Cymbeline. But one thing that's true of all of Shakespeare's plays, no matter the genre, is that they all have a five act structure. Now, Shakespeare did not originally divide his plays into five acts. That happened later. So while the divisions aren't necessary to consuming his work, they can be really helpful to beginners trying to make sense of the structure of the play. In act one of every Shakespeare play, we get our exposition and our inciting incident. Your exposition is gonna include meeting all of the characters you're gonna need to know for later and pretty much just setting up the scene of the play. The inciting incident is really important. This is the moment or the event that spurs the rest of the play into action, that forces characters out of their norm and into something that we can call drama. In act two of every Shakespeare play, you have your rising action and your complications to the inciting incident. Your rising action is exactly what it sounds like. Things in the play are starting to heat up, characters are making quick decisions, and the stakes are getting higher as we go. Complications to the inciting incident include things the characters have decided to do or have been forced to do because of the inciting incident in act one. Act three is the climax. Here we get to see the characters' quick decisions played out and usually start to see how they go wrong. Act four of each Shakespeare play includes the falling action of the play. Characters are making far fewer decisions in front of the audience and now experiencing the natural progression of events after the decisions that they've already made. And act five of each play is the denouement. This includes the tying up of loose ends and in tragedies, usually death. In comedies, a wedding. But even with a five act structure, most of the time the text is what's really the most intimidating. So let's talk a little bit about his language. First of all, punctuation is vital. Do not ignore it. I know it's very common for people reading Shakespeare for the first time to read it without punctuation. For instance, in Hamlet's act one scene two soliloquy, it would be very common for people reading this to read it as follows. Oh, that this too too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. When, if you pay less attention to the line breaks and more attention to the punctuation, you get something that sounds more like this. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. The text might still be intimidating, but the flow of the speech is important. I know you know how to tell where the end of a sentence is, so read Shakespeare the same way you would anything else, and then you're able to divide it up and read each sentence on its own instead of getting caught up in the beginning of the next sentence or the end of the previous one. Often dashes in Shakespeare indicate a shift in the speaker's thought. Body, like Niobe, all tears, why, she, oh God, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer. He's in the middle of a sentence. He shifts tone. The punctuation can be really helpful. When I first started reading Shakespeare on my own, I would often circle all of the punctuation in a line so that I would force myself to pay attention to it. And then I would read the scene out loud, breathing on each comma, stopping on each period. This really helps you get a sense of how his words are supposed to sound. But also being familiar with Shakespeare's meter can be super helpful. Now, Shakespeare writes writes his plays in both prose and in verse. Oftentimes verse is used in moments of great emotion. It's sort of like in musicals when characters begin to sing because talking no longer does them justice. And Shakespeare writes in iambic pentameter. This means that when Shakespeare's writing in verse, each of his lines should have 10 syllables, which include five feet. And a foot in iambic pentameter is two syllables. If the line is written in perfect pentameter, it will have an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable and that foot five times. So it will sound like ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. For an example from Shakespeare of a line in perfect pentameter, I'll switch over to Macbeth, act one, scene seven, when Lady Macbeth says, but screw your courage to the sticking place. If I read this line in iambic pentameter, it would sound like this, but screw your courage to the sticking place. Obviously, actors aren't going to go up on stage and speak Shakespeare that way, but Shakespeare is giving the actors lots of clues as to which words are important 
and which words mean more than others. In this line, the first foot is but screw. Screw is a much more important word in this sentence than but. Screw is the verb, the action word, what she's imploring Macbeth to do. But screw your courage to the sticking place. She's emphasizing exactly what she wants him to do. And Shakespeare's letting the actor know how to do that by writing in pentameter. Writing out which syllables are stressed and unstressed over the lines is something called scansion. And in this famous line, it would look something like this. But not every line of Shakespeare is in perfect pentameter. But when you know the outline, then you start to see Shakespeare play with the language and give the actors even bigger clues. For example, in Hamlet's famous to be or not to be soliloquy, the first line reads, to be or not to be, that is the question. If you scan this out and listen to it in beats, you hear five feet and then something interesting. To be or not to be, that is the question. There's an 11th syllable in this line. Even Shakespeare fucks around and finds out sometimes, but usually what this means is that the character is questioning something. If it's not written in perfect pentameter, their thoughts aren't whole, they're not complete, they're confused. Here, he's not pretending to be insane or pretending to be suicidal. He really is turning this question over in his mind. Now, when I was in Shakespeare shows, I would scan every single line that I spoke in the play. But when you're just reading Shakespeare, scansion isn't always necessary. One of the reasons I like to talk so much about meter and iambic pentameter when I'm talking about Shakespeare is that iambic pentameter sounds like a heartbeat. But screw your courage to the stick place. There's a reason people for centuries have been having such a visceral reaction to his language and find it so beautiful. But that also means that when Shakespeare breaks meter, it means something. Characters can finish the metered line that another character has already begun. This happens frequently in love scenes. It's as though the character's words are falling into lockstep and they're so in sync that they're finishing the very heartbeat of the previous person. Romeo and Juliet are constantly finishing each other's lines of verse. My biggest tip for reading Shakespeare on your own is to read it out loud. A lot of times chewing the words and letting them turn over in your mouth can be the thing that you need to really understand what the characters are saying. When you read it out loud, it's harder to ignore the pulse and the feeling that Shakespeare has imbued in all of his language. And adding on to that, I think it's very helpful to watch an adaptation of the play that you read before you read it, and sometimes after you read it, and sometimes even during your read of the play. That's why I always recommend that people begin with the more adapted works. The ones that you probably already know a little bit about just from living in a society that relies so heavily on Shakespeare. When I sit down to read a Shakespeare play, I by no means understand every single line on the first read. Sometimes lines like the multitudinous sea incarnadine come up. I don't know what the fuck that means. But watching adaptations before you've read the work is really helpful because then you're focusing more on the language and the things that make Shakespeare beautiful than you are focusing on the basic plot of the play. So much of reading Shakespeare Shakespeare just has to do with the amount of effort that you're willing to put in. Reading Shakespeare is never going to be as easy as reading something that was written last year. There just is a learning curve to the language. There's a lot of vocabulary that we don't continue to use to this day that can be somewhat confusing. It's really helpful to know some of the basics of words that are often used in Shakespeare. For example, why does Shakespeare always say or instead of over or ne'er instead of never? Usually it's to cut out syllables so that the line can still be written in I big pentameter. And once you realize that, then it stops being confusing why he has apostrophes all over the place and you start to realize he's just trying to squeeze everything in so that it fits nice and neat. If it's easier for you to understand the line by reading it over or never, there's nothing wrong with that. And on the flip side, if he's using accents over certain syllables, he's most likely adding syllables so that they fit in pentameter. Shakespeare's just trying to check the assignment requirements and fit them as best he can into what he's writing. I'm gonna let you know which Shakespeare plays I think you should start with. In my opinion, the easiest plays to start with are probably going to be Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet in terms of tragedies. Editing Sally here. I definitely meant to say Macbeth because Hamlet is a really tough play, but I keep using Hamlet as my example, so I'm sorry. But I will say, if you can find the Andrew Scott version of Hamlet, start with that one. When it comes to Romeo and Juliet, the Baz Luhrmann one will be easy to grasp the basic plot and prime your brain to read the language of the actual play. And it's fun to watch. It's set in the 80s or the 90s in California, so it's colorful, fun, interesting, and Baz Luhrmann really is able to keep your attention. For Hamlet, I highly encourage you to try to find online a recording of Andrew Scott's uh, stage version of Hamlet that he did. I have 
have read Hamlet multiple times and seen multiple productions and never did I understand it as well and as fully as I did than when I watched the recording of that play. And that is all to do with Andrew Scott having a complete mastery of the language in a way that makes it very difficult for you as the audience to misunderstand what he's saying. It's brilliant. For comedies, I would recommend starting with A Midsummer Night's Dream, the movie adaptation with Stanley Tucci and Michelle Pfeiffer and Christian Bale. It's really well done and definitely gets the plot across while still using the original language. I have always understood his plays more after I've seen good adaptations of them than after I've just sat down and read them. With that being said, there's so much beautiful language sitting in English classrooms that kids aren't taught how to appreciate. So I'm hoping that by making this video, I'm giving you a few of the tools in my toolbox. I couldn't by any means cover everything in this video. Once you begin to read and understand Shakespeare, you'll start to notice how frequently other authors reference his work, lean on it for plot devices, or even how much of your daily vocabulary has been created and originated by William Shakespeare himself. I want so desperately to be able to share some of the magic of Shakespeare with you. That being said, if you have any specific questions about Shakespeare, please drop them in the comments because I would love to answer them or talk to you about Shakespeare. Down below, I will link a couple different performances of Hamlet's famous to be or not to be soliloquy so you can see how different interpretations of Shakespeare can be. I want to know what your favorite Shakespeare play is, your favorite characters, your favorite moments, because they're always just living rent free, rattling around in my brain. As always, like and subscribe. I want to give a big shout out to my Shakespeare mentor and one of my best friends, because I would not know any of this, and I would not have an unending and deep, deep love for his work if it weren't for everything that she's taught me in our nearly 10 years of friendship. Oh my god, Raya, it's been 10 years. So to Raya, I want to say the first line of Shakespeare I ever heard you say, I love you more than words can wield the matter. And to everyone else, in case you haven't heard it today, I love you. And may flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. I had to!